five, four, three, two, one. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. Hey everyone, it's Randy Coppola, U.S. Launch Report and Veteran Space Report. And here we are at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex for the induction into the Astronaut Hall of Fame of astronauts Grunsfeld, Rominger, Lindsay, and Seddon. More about their accomplishments later, but some quick news that's been for the groundbreaking that took place. It was a groundbreaking ceremony to move the Astronaut Hall of Fame, which is down the road a few miles, right over to this location. So big changes are taking place as the astronaut corps is recognized for all their accomplishments and we'll bring you the information right here. Thanks for watching. Our final inductee is Ray Said. Successful and efficient space lab flown to date. 
During her time at NASA, Stetton worked in a variety of areas. She led the planning of and served as a helicopter physician for operations with the search and rescue forces and NASA for the first four shuttle flights. Helped develop the medical kit and checklist, shuttle food systems, crew medical officer training, and life sciences experiment plans for the shuttle program. Made major contributions to Challenger accident investigations. Represented the astronaut office on the NASA Aerospace Advisory Committee and Bioethics Task Force. Served as Capcom and more. After leaving NASA in 1997, Dr. Stedden served as the Assistant Chief Medical Officer of the Vanderbilt Medical Group in Nashville for 11 years. There, she led an initiative aimed at improving patient safety, quality of care, and team effectiveness by the use of an aviation-based model of crew resource management. Now, with LifeWings Partners, she teaches this concept to healthcare institutions across the United States. Recently, she has written a memoir entitled, Go for Orbit, to inspire young women to pursue careers in science and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Grace Seth. for induction into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut, Luke Gibson. Sitting there saying, 
Can women really have it? Well, there is no doubt about it. The women have hacked it easily as good, if not better, than any of us ever did, because we weren't under the same microscope that they were. Ray and I took turns flying. I flew in 1984 as the astronaut hero, and she was the astronaut spouse. 1985, she was the astronaut hero, and I got to be the astronaut spouse. I flew in 86, it went on that way the whole time we were there. We took turns flying. So one of us would be the hero, and the other one would be the spouse. Now, I got asked all the time, did you and Ray ever fly together in space? And the, the joke that I like to tell is, well, no, you know, that really wouldn't have worked. It just wouldn't have worked out. Most of the time when I flew, I was the mission commander. And so how's it going to work? I turn to Ray and I say, Ray, it's time to open the sun shields. And she's going to say, you want the sun shields open. <laughs> you go open them yourself. <laughs> Don't try and put this mission commander stuff on me. So it just wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked for us to fly together. Now, okay, that's a joke. That never happened. But here's a true story. This actually did happen. When I was made chief astronaut, I couldn't supervise my wife because in the government service, you can't be your wife's boss or supervise. So what they did was on a piece of paper, a worthless piece of paper, they transferred her to report directly to my boss, the director of flight operations. So I remember, you know, several times I'd say, Ray, you know what you need to do? You need to do this. And she'd say, I don't work for you. <laughs> and I'd say, yes, you do. You're an astronaut. I'm the chief astronaut. You work for me. And she'd say, no, I don't. I report to the director of flight operations. So why should it be any different in the office than it was at home? <laughs> As a spouse, I had to get over some things uh, that took a little while to get used to. When Ray and I first married, she kept her maiden name. That's why she's still Ray Seddon. And the boys, my buddies in the astronaut corps, put a name tag on my locker in the, in the astronaut gym that said, Boot Seddon. <laughs> I gotta tell you, it really torqued me off. <laughs> and I knew darn well that if I did what I wanted to do, which was rip that thing off the locker, throw it in the trash, there'd be another one up the very next day. <laughs> so I knew that I couldn't do that. So I let it sit there for three years. And then I ripped it off and threw it in the trash. <laughs> and fortunately, I didn't get another one. But there were things that I had to get used to. Speaking of, when I first married Ray, I want to thank all of you for being here today to celebrate our 34th wedding anniversary. Which is so this is the real reason that all of us are here today. <laughs> Uh, I also had one more opportunity to, uh, to learn to smile and be a good spouse. Uh, along with John Blaha's group, SDS 58, we attended the Fiesta Bowl, I think it was 1993, and her crew was the featured crew, and I was there at the time, I was the chief astronaut, but I was an astronaut spouse attending the Fiesta Bowl. You can see it coming. They had a name tag for me, and it said, Mr. Seddon. <laughs> so, over the years, I have learned to handle all of this. Well, Ray and I have been extremely fortunate. We have been extremely lucky. I have been extremely lucky to have her. We enjoy flying eight missions between the two of us over that 18, 19 years that we spent at NASA. And we got to work with wonderful folks like these. So what an experience it has been for us. What a journey it has been for us. <clears throat> Maybe I can't say that. <laughs> Great life with you has been beyond my wildest dreams. On behalf of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, welcome to the Astronaut Hall of Fame.
tall as Ken Rominger. <laughs> moments in everyone's life when he or she looks around and says, what the heck am I doing here? But those of us who have flown in space, that moment often comes when we first look out the window at the Earth from orbit. But uh, I'm having one of those moments right now, having watched my friends and my husband be inducted into this auspicious group. I never expected to be standing here. A doctor who mostly wanted to do life sciences research? Come on. But my goals when I came to NASA were simple and they never wavered. On the shuttle, when the astronaut explorers were looking at the heavens, at the stars, and others were looking at our magnificent Earth, I wanted to look at the explorers that were doing those jobs. When I became part of the astronaut corps in 1978, I had wonderful mentors like those of you who are here today, and I so much appreciate that. I came from a medical background and didn't really know much about computers or space flight or anything like that, uh, so I was very lucky that there were people that, uh, that helped me along the way. Being part of the first group of um, women astronauts, there was a particular pressure on us to do well. I think each of us knew, as I did, that if I did something uh, wrong or made a big mistake, people wouldn't say, Ray Seddon made a mistake, they would say, women can't do this job. So there was extra pressure on us back right then. I was fortunate that Dr. Joe Kerwin, who flew on the first Skylab mission and was the first physician in space, became a mentor to me. We flew all across the country uh, talking to very eminent scientists who hoped to put experiments on the space shuttle. And so that really got me off to a pretty good start. I had many uh, assignments at NASA, things like verifying the space shuttle software and um, using the robot arm. But I also got to work on things that I knew something about, like what should the contents of the space shuttle medical kit be? And even some things like defining the training uh, for the non-physician astronauts who would serve as crew medical officers. I mean, can you imagine uh, Hoot and some of these guys learning how to be doctors? <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> On my first flight in 1985, we saw some of the film, and by the way, did you notice that over time, the quality of the film improved? The cameras got a little bit better. Uh, it was kind of a vanilla flight, of course, any flight's a good flight, especially your first one. But we were to launch a couple of satellites and to do a few small uh, experiments, and uh, it was a short flight, five days. But things got interesting when one of those satellites didn't work. We deployed it into space, and it didn't turn itself on. And you saw some of, on the video. My job, Mission Control came up with a plan uh, to help us figure out how to turn on that satellite. My job, as you saw, was to, to design that fly swatter, to build it by their design. I got to do the first surgery in space, sewing that thing together. Uh, it was interesting, uh, the Capcom and Mission Control uh, called up and said, um, that she's, you're a really good seamstress. Sally Wright happened to be in Mission Control at the time, and she said, no, she's a really good surgeon. <laughs> so I appreciated that. It, was, uh, it came, became even more interesting when um, two members of the crew had to go out and do a spacewalk to attach those devices uh, to the end of the robot arm. And uh, that was Dave Briggs and, of course, Jeff Hoffman, who's sitting down here. And Jeff, can you believe that that was 30 years ago last month? We haven't aged a bit, have we? Then <laughs> there were two other members of the crew who had the very important task of going and rendezvousing with that shuttle. Now remember, none of us have been trained to do any of this. The rendezvous was particularly um, sporty uh, because we had to go over and fly up really close um, to a multi-ton satellite that was slowly drifting in space. And of course, our commander, Bo Bobko, who is uh, also here today, thank you for coming, Bo, uh, did a masterful job um, getting us over close enough for me to flip that switch with the uh, fly swatters on the end of the arm to try it turn and try and turn it on. Well, unfortunately, the satellite did not even activate, and another crew had to go up later and rewire the internal uh, electronics on it to get it on its way. 
The ground thought we would be really disappointed that the satellite didn't turn itself on. Uh, but believe it or not, we were we were elated. We had done things that had never been planned. We had um, great support from Mission Control, who helped us uh, through it, told us how to do it, and uh, we were just happy that uh, that we didn't kill ourselves. Um, I guess there was one uh, other really important um, mission that I had to accomplish on that flight. Uh, we flew the first politician in space, Senator Jake Garn from Utah. Um, and Jake uh, volunteered to do some uh, studies of space motion sickness that affects a lot of astronauts. And um, the press came to call him Barfing Jake Garn. <laughs> he did his job really well. <laughs> but it was my duty to make sure that he made it back alive. <laughs> As was mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, my other two flights were the ones that I really hoped for when I came to fly for NASA. That was Space Lab Life Sciences 1 and 2. And as was also mentioned, as we mentioned, not a whole lot of people volunteered to do those icky flights where you got poked and prodded. Uh, but I was always fascinated uh, to help understand um, the magnificent adaptability of the human body. So we looked at many body systems while we were in, in, in space, and we got to see how they all interacted together for the first time. Importantly, half of the eight subjects on those two flights were women. And when we got the data back, we could say for sure that women adapted to weightlessness the same way that men do. That was a very important thing to prove. Well, on this journey, I met and married Duke and became a second, daughter, a second mother to his beautiful daughter, Julie who is here with two of my grandsons all the way from Madagascar. <laughs> <laughs> and she really did come from Madagascar. <laughs> but it wasn't South America, what the feel? Good, I'm glad I got that straight. And I also produced the world's first astro tot. Uh, and that's a child born to two astronauts, that's Paul. And then two others, Dan and Emily, who are also here with me uh, today. But I want you to imagine back into the dark ages uh, of 1982, when Hood and I had to go and tell the, our big boss, uh, the director of the uh, Johnson Space Center, Dr. Chris Kraft, about my pregnancy. You know, there had been a lot of hoopla the year before when we married each other. Everybody, you know, talked about that. Wow, astronauts marrying each other. And so we walked into Dr. Kraft's office and sat down, and Hood said very seriously, Dr. Kraft, we have something to tell you. And he looked rather alarmed, and he said, you're getting divorced. <laughs> <laughs> we said, no, there's a better uh, news than that. Well, everything went really well with those pregnancies, and we proved once and for all that astronauts can have babies, too. That was the first. So for those of you who know who, you know, you understand um, his wicked sense of humor, and how interesting it has been. He's got a halo above his head. To be married to him. Well, who loves airplanes? And he delighted in uh, teaching me how to fly the NASA jets. Although, on occasion, he did refer to me as talking ballast, I think. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> quiet those jets can get when you're at 35,000 feet and both your engines quit. <laughs> Very quiet. Well, we survived that episode and I had the great honor to become an astronaut spouse on Hoops 5 flights. And I developed a great admiration for the women and then the men who held that title. In all the craziness of a crew's getting ready uh, for flight, it's the spouses that have to pick up the slack. And they have to steal themselves for the fear from the fear that they have in their own hearts. So bless them all for the often unrecognized contributions that they made to human spaceflight. And of course, who had to play spouse too? During my first flight, he had to take care of young Paul, who was not yet three years old. And afterwards, friends said, oh, they were so cute walking down the beach together, looking at the pretty girls. <laughs> <laughs> and then some of his friends said, yeah, he's going around saying that Paul made really good crap.
controlling base. <laughs> <laughs> well, this occasion is kind of like a pre-launch um, uh, reception, only better. As crews for our flights, we're always in quarantine and never get to say hello to our guests. So I'm looking forward on this occasion to uh, saying hi to all of my friends who are here and introducing them to one another. And I look forward to greeting you all, especially my own cheering section from Murfreesboro. Well, today is another kind of launch for me. Uh, my new book, Go for Orbit, about my NASA days, was just published, rolled off the presses last week. And I have, I'll have some copies available for signing at a private reception this evening, but also there are some at the bookstore, and I'll be there tomorrow afternoon at 3, for those of you who are still here that would like a signed copy. Uh, it's been um, in work since I was at NASA. That's over 20 years, so um, it's quite nice to have it out the door. I want to give my heartfelt thanks to the Astronaut Hall of Fame for the wonderful honor that they're bestowing on me today. I look forward to supporting the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation that allows young people to live their dreams as I did. Thank you all for sharing this very special occasion.